Last week, we began the book of Malachi, which I find very fitting because we were in Genesis, which was the first book of the Old Testament, and now, very fittingly, we are in Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. We went over the first 10 verses last week, and this morning we'll be going over actually the largest chunk of text uh, of any sermon in our series, so we're going to have quite a bit to deal with. Um, So let's stand as we read our text for this morning. We will be reading Malachi 1, 11 through 2, verse 9. Malachi chapter 1, verse 11 through chapter 2, verse 9. My name will be great among the nations, from the rising of the sun to its setting. Incense and pure offerings will be presented in my name in every place, because my name will be great among, all, uh, among the nations, says the Lord of armies. But you are profaning it when you say the Lord's table is defiled, and its product, its food, is contemptible. You also say, look, what a nuisance, and you scorn it, says the Lord of, of armies. You bring stolen, lame, or sick animals. You bring this as an offering. Am I to accept that from your hands? Asked the Lord. The deceiver is cursed who has an acceptable male in his flock and makes a vow, but sacrifices a defective animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of armies, and my name will be feared among the nations. Therefore, this decree is for you, priests. If you don't listen, and if you don't take it to heart to honor my name, says the Lord of armies, I will send a curse among you, and I will curse your blessings. In fact, I have already begun to curse them because you are not taking it to heart. Look, I am going to rebuke your descendants, and I will spread animal waste over your faces, the waste from your festival sacrifices, and you will be taken away with it. Then you will know that I sent you this decree so that my covenant with Levi may continue says the Lord of armies. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave these to him. It called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and integrity and turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, And people should desire instruction from his mouth, because he is the messenger of the Lord of armies. You, on the other hand, have turned from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have violated the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of armies. So I, in turn, have made you despised and humiliated before all the people, because you are not keeping my ways, but are showing partiality in your instruction. You may be seated. If you haven't figured it out, virtually none of this would look good on a pillow, right? This is not a a, a very happy book, right? In Sunday school, we have been going through the book of Philippians under Pastor Bruce, and and you'll notice if you've been part of of his class that that, that Paul has, has great things to say about the church in Philippi. Not so with Malachi. This has not been very good for them. Uh, last week we looked at, the, the, at the, the first 10 verses and Malachi was not pleased with the people of Israel and he had indicted Israel in those earlier verses. And as we have read, he does not change his tune as we move into this passage. So getting right into the text, the first indictment that we see here is that the worship of in Israel is deceptive, is being deceptive. Uh, Let's read Malachi 1, 12 through 14, go back into it. But you are profaning it when you say the Lord's table is defiled and its product, its food, is contemptible. You also say, look, what a nuisance, and you scorn it, says the Lord of armies. You bring stolen, lame, or sick animals. You bring this as an offering 
Am I to accept that from your hands, asks the Lord. And this is all to set up this verse here. The deceiver is cursed who has an acceptable male in his flock and makes a vow but sacrifices a defective animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of armies, and my name will be feared among the nations. Quick translation note here. You'll notice that the the name of our series is the Lord of hosts. Another word for host is armies. So some of your translations will say the Lord of hosts and others will say the Lord of armies. But you will see how often, I have repa- how often I have repeated the phrase, Lord of armies, already in this sermon. And we're only a few minutes in. He uses this phrase throughout the book extensively. And that's why it is the name of our series. Now, we're going to get to the deceptive part. We're going to get into why exactly it's deceptive in just a moment. But go back to verse 12. Look at what the Israelites are saying here. Now, these are priests here, and they are saying that the Lord's table is defiled. Defiled. Its product, its food is contemptible. What a nuisance. And and before we really deal with that, I want to explain why they would care about it in the first place. Because, as you can imagine, it's easy for us to not know all the ins and outs of the Levitical priesthood system. So when Joshua led the Israelites into the promised land, God gave land to 11 of the 12 tribes. The one tribe that did not get land was the tribe of Levi. They got no large portion of land as their inheritance. Instead, they got the exclusive opportunity to serve as priests of the most high God. You might think of that as a burden, certainly these priests are, but in all honesty, no other tribe was allowed such a high honor. And this meant that the other 11 tribes would come to the Levites at the tabernacle, or at the time of Malachi, it would have been at the newly built second temple. (coughs) They would offer sacrifices to the priest. And that animal would belong to the priest as his animal to eat and to feed his family. So the reason the priest cares about the quality of the animal is because that's his food. He wants nice dinner, right? We don't go out looking for rotten steak. We want want the good stuff. And they're not getting the good stuff. And that's their complaint. The food that they're getting from the people of Israel is disgusting. And so they say, the Lord's table is defiled. Its food is contemptible. But hold on. Hold on for a second. They are complaining to God that the quality of the sacrifices are so poor. But who is to blame? Who is to blame? Why, are they, why is it that they are dealing with these blind and lame and sick animals here? Is that what God prescribed? Did God allow these blind and sick animals for sacrifice? Absolutely not. If you have your Bibles, I would open up to Leviticus chapter 1. Yes, we are in Leviticus. Um, Leviticus Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3. Leviticus 1, 3 says, If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to bring an unblemished male. He will bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting so that he may be accepted by the Lord. Move on to verse 10. But if his offering for a burnt offering is from the flock, from sheep or goats, he is to present an unblemished male. Go to uh, chapter 3, verse 1. If his offering is a fellowship sacrifice and he is presenting an animal from the herd, whether male or female, he is to present one without blemish. Before the Lord. Leviticus 4.32. Or if the offering that he brings is a, as a sin offering is a lamb, he is to bring an unblemished female. And we could go on. There's, this is the book of Leviticus we're talking about. Tons of verses about this. So God required that the people only offer unblemished animals. Obviously lame, sick, 
and blind animals do not qualify. So if the question is, why are there sick animals at the temple? There are two reasons. Two reasons. Number one is that the people of Israel are not concerned with offering right offerings. If they were careful to do what God's word commanded, they would never have brought these animals at the temple. But they are not the only ones at fault. Because number two, the priests of the temple, who are the descendants of Aaron. These are the descendants of Levi. God's priests are not concerned with worshiping as God has commanded. Because if they were, they would have refused the offerings as unbiblical. So these priests are complaining that the table is is defiled and that their food is contemptible, but they are the ones who made it defiled and contemptible. And we might be We might want to stick up for perhaps, maybe not the priests, but maybe maybe the 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 people of Israel. We might say, hold on a second. What if this blind, sick sheep is the only sheep that this family has? What if that's the only one? What are the priests supposed to do for the less fortunate for their sin offerings? Because one might say, well, they're not supposed to, but, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be nice. And we're going to allow this unqualified sacrifice because, well, maybe they're poor. They just don't have other better sheep. Well, going back to Leviticus, going to chapter 5, we see that God has actually already provided for the poor in the sacrificial system. So if we can go to Leviticus 5, verses 5 through 13, I'll read it. If someone incurs guilt in one of these cases, he is to confess he has committed that sin. He must bring his penalty for guilt for the sin he has committed to the Lord. A female lamb or goat from the flock is a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement on his behalf for his sin. But if he cannot afford an animal from the flock... Then he may bring to the Lord two turtle doves or two young pigeons as a penalty for guilt for his sin, one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering. He is to bring them to the priest who will first present the one for the sin offering. He is to twist its head at the back of the neck without severing it, much detail here. Then he will sprinkle some of the blood of the sin offering on the side of the altar, while the rest of the blood is to be drained out at the base of the altar. It is a sin offering. He will prepare the second bird as a burnt offering according to the regulation. In this way, the priest will make atonement on his behalf for the sin he has committed, and he will be forgiven. But if he cannot afford two turtle doves or two young pigeons, he may bring two quarts of fine flour as an offering for his sin. He must not put olive oil or frankincense on it, for it is a sin offering. He is to bring it to the priest, who will take a handful from it as its memorial portion and burn it on the altar along with the fire offerings to the Lord. It is a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement on his behalf concerning the sin he has committed in any of these cases, and he will be forgiven. The rest will belong to the priest, like the grain offering. So the fact is, these animals are not being offered because it is all they have. These animals are being offered because both people and priest is apathetic to the things of God. They are apathetic to the things of God. So what does God have to say about this? We go to verse 14. The deceiver is cursed who has an acceptable male in his flock and makes a vow, but sacrifices a defective animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of armies, and my name will be feared among the nations. So look at what's happening here. They go to the temple to seek forgiveness, to seek atonement, but they don't care how God wants it done. And he tells them that they're going to get a curse instead of a blessing. It's the exact opposite of the reason why they are coming, because they are deceiving Attempting to deceive the Lord. 
but you cannot deceive the Lord. So we move into chapter 2, and God has words for the priests, specifically for the priests. So why is God giving this decree to the priests when the people of Israel were at fault as well? And the reason is because the, the, the Levitical priests had the responsibility of fencing the table. They were the leaders here. And we know this in the secular world. We know this in general. When the people fail, it is the leader's responsibility to handle it. That's why they are leaders. The priests were leaders, but they weren't acting like leaders. So God directs his attention to them. Now we're going to save uh, God's decree that we see here for just a little bit later. We're going to jump around a bit. Let's jump to verse 5. Malachi 2, Malachi 2, 5. Here, God contrasts the behavior of the Levitical priests with that of the early priesthood. And my understanding is that this is personified under Levi. So not that Malachi is specifically talking about Levi the person. Because, I mean, we didn't talk about Levi much when we were in Genesis. But he was not a priest. He just wasn't a priest. At no point does Levi the man become a priest. So my understanding is that God is referring to the priests who appropriately worshipped God. These faithful sons of Levi. That that is the Levi as we understand here. So if, and it obviously is not, if contempt for the temple is not biblical worship, then what did the faithful of Levi do? What was their job? You see Malachi 2.5. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave these to him. It called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. God demanded reverence. Any biblical worship should be reverent. There is a reverence necessary. Now, I do want to point this out. Reverence is not the same thing as quiet. Sometimes people make the mistake of the two. It is possible to be loud during preaching and still be reverent. And it is possible to be irreverent while someone is preaching, and be perfectly still and quiet. Um, So this past uh, Monday and Tuesday, my wife and I were at the Missouri Baptist Convention as messengers for this church, and and there were a number of sermons there. And, you know, I'm going to be honest with you, for a bunch of old white guys, there was a lot of amens and yes, sir, and especially the guy behind me. That's right, preacher. That's right. That's right. That's right. There's a lot of that's right. Almost... Almost too much, that's right. We don't necessarily need that much, that's right. But that's not irreverent, right? Irreverent is when you sit down, and this is the key word, plan. You plan on letting your eyes glaze over for 45 minutes, waiting for the service to be over. That is irreverent. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that you have to start hooping and hollering and that's right and all that stuff. I'm not saying that. I'm not going there. I'm just saying that we need to make sure that we are present and engaged as we worship God. We must be engaged. We are offering worship to God. And we cannot do that if all we're focused on is lunch or whatever you have planned for the rest of the day, or your business issues for this upcoming week. That is not reverent worship. Now, speaking of of teaching and preaching, we see in Malachi 2 that part of the godly worship that God expected at that time was biblical teaching. So go to verses 6 and 7. Malachi 2, 6 and 7. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and integrity and turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, 
And people should desire instruction from his mouth because he is the messenger of the Lord of armies. Until not too long ago, I had in my mind that the only thing that God has called a, a Levitical priest under the old covenant to do was offer sacrifices. But passages like this explain that no, a priest also explained the word. He taught the people. It was the responsibility of the priest to teach the word of the Lord to the people. And we're going to talk about this more in a bit, but we do see one more aspect of this in the way that the priests in Malachi's time failed their people. So we go all the way to verse 9. So the end of our passage for this morning, Malachi 2.9 says, So I, in turn, have made you despised and humiliated before all the people, because you are not keeping my ways, but are showing partiality in your instruction. They were not teaching people well. And this could mean one of two things. The first possibility is that they were choosing some people to teach, and others to ignore, right? So if this is the case, they would have likely reserved instruction of the Lord only to the wealthy and the influential and those who could bribe them into whatever power or, or, or money or, or food or what have you. I don't think that that's the likely possibility, but it is a possibility. The text is not explicit here. I think though, that more likely is that they were choosing only some parts of Scripture to teach. At this point, we're into at least definitely the first five books of the Bible, um, likely the majority of the Psalms. Uh, the, uh, obviously, the full Old Testament canon is not to their disposal because we're reading from the Old Testament canon, but there was a sizable portion of divine revelation that the priests had the responsibility to teach. And my suspicion is that they were omitting certain parts. They, their teaching was with partiality. And my guess, we don't know, my guess is that many of the priestly responsibilities themselves were not taught about. That way, they don't feel obligated to live, up, to live up to them. Because if nobody knows what their responsibilities are, nobody's going to judge them for not living up to those responsibilities, right? Or perhaps they did not want to upset faithful offerers. And so they did not teach things that would offend them. After all... This guy over here, he brings the best sheep. So this guy may be, um, idol idolatry wouldn't really have been the issue here, but he may be doing something wicked and despicable. But you know what, I'm just, we're going to let that go because I know how to make a great stew with his offering. That's not how that works. So whatever the case was, the priests in Malachi's day failed to teach biblically and they failed to do their job. So lastly, we get to verse 6. We see that the priests were called to live with integrity. Verse 6. True instruction was in his mouth and nothing wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and integrity and turned many away from iniquity. They did not live with biblical integrity. To contrast, these priests did not do that. They, they did not live with biblical teaching. They were not reverent. And God tells them through Malachi that this failure will have consequences. So what did God threaten to do to these priests? What were the consequences of their improper worship? Let's look at verse 2. Two and three. If you don't listen and if you don't take it to heart to honor my name, says the Lord of armies, I will send a curse among you and I will curse your blessings. 
In fact, I have already begun to curse them because you are not taking it to heart. This next verse is something. Look, I am going to rebuke your descendants and I will spread animal waste over your faces. The waste from your festival sacrifices and you will be taken away with it. Let's be honest, that sounds disgusting. Very disgusting. And I, I mean, it's, it's in the text, right? We can't just act like it's not in the text. God threatens to take animal poop and spread it over their faces. And we could probably glean more from this passage, but let's just leave it at complete abject humiliation and leave it at that. So moving to verses 8 and 9, we see that God will cause Israel to be despised among the world. And we just looked at animal waste, so I'm not surprised. Uh, Malachi 2, 8 and 9. You, on the other hand, have turned from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have violated the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of armies. So I, in turn, have made you despised and humiliated before all the people, because you are not keeping my ways, but are showing partiality in your instruction. (laughs) So in summary, God demanded right worship from the people of Israel and from the Jewish priests, and they were not giving it to him. Remember, this is after the Babylonian exile. These people just spent 70 years in captivity for failing to worship God properly, and now they're doing it again. Human sinfulness, as we all know, has a way of getting us to fall into the same sins over and over again, no matter what it has cost us already. So we've been jumping around a lot this morning. And I have touched on every verse in our passage, except one. One verse I have not mentioned since we first read it. Malachi 1.11. Malachi 1.11. Very different verse. Let's take a look at it. My name will be great among the nations, from the rising of the sun to its setting. Incense and pure offerings will be presented in my name in every place, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of armies. We've looked at how God demanded right worship in the Levitical covenant. We've looked extensively now at how great the priests in Malachi's time have failed to live up to these expectations. But here in verse 11 of chapter 1, we see God not looking at where time is now, but looking towards the future. It's a time when God will receive right worship, proper worship. Look at what it says. Incense and pure offerings will be presented in my name in every place. Now, hold on a second. Doesn't God demand sacrifice only at the temple? Where does proper biblical worship take place? And I think we all know this answer, but let's look at it it with our own eyes. Let's move forward 400 years when God's people dwell not under Persian rule, but under Roman rule. When Jews and Samaritans are bitter enemies, we see a Jewish rabbi speaking with a Samaritan woman about this very issue. So turn with me to John, the book of John, chapter 4. We'll read verses 19 through 24. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here 
when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. It's no longer a place. It's exactly what we see in the book of Malachi. In every place, right worship is offered. And look at what else it says. Incense and pure offerings will be presented in my name in every place because my name will be great among the nations. The nations. In the midst of rebuking the Jewish priests for their irreverence, their unbiblical teaching, and their unbiblical worship, God tells his people that one day, God will be worshipped not just among Jews, but Gentiles. Go to Acts chapter 11, and we see the cogs begin to turn in the minds of the early Christians. <clears throat> Acts 11 Verses 15 through 18. Peter is recalling the event that just happened. He said, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came down on them, just as on us at the beginning. I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then... God gave them the same gift that he also gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. How could I possibly hinder God? And I always visualize this next, this next verse. I love it. When they heard this, they became silent. And then they glorified God, saying, So then, God has given repentance, resulting in life even to the Gentiles. <clears throat> If you have noticed, I, I have structured this sermon quite particularly. If you've noticed, I've given very little application to this text. It has probably felt quite distant as a sermon. Not necessarily much to grab onto. And I did that intentionally because I have chosen to focus on Malachi 1.11 through 2.9 as concerning old covenant worship. But we are no longer under the old covenant. Sacrifices are unnecessary. There are no more priests. The future that Malachi refers to here in verse 11 is our present day. We are new covenant believers offering new covenant worship. So looking at this text, looking at Malachi 1, 11 through 2, 9, what does it mean to worship God under the new covenant? <clears throat> How are we to worship God here in this building at this time in 2018 and, and we're about to be in 2019 and after that? What does it look like? Put in other words, the question is, what makes up appropriate biblical worship? And if we see anything in our text this morning, we see that not all worship is equally acceptable to God. There is worship that is right and good and holy. And there is worship that is so disgusting to God that it would be like spreading animal waste over his face. Throughout the Protestant Reformation, there have been two primary understandings of this issue, two primary principles that have come out concerning worship. One is called the regulative principle of worship, and the other is called the normative principle of worship. Now, let me make this clear. Let me make this just, I just want to let you know, I do not have all the answers on this. This is a topic with which I have much to study it is complex. We could spend weeks talking about this, right? So I'm not asking you to walk out of here with this complete, full-orbed, dynamic, robust theology that has no holes, no questions, no, no, none of that, right? If you have questions, please talk to me. Talk to Bruce. Talk to Chris next week. You know, we, we have thoughts on the matter, and 
Chris and Bruce may be very well much more studied than I, I'm not sure, but we can definitely steer you in the direction where answers can be found if we can't exactly explain it ourselves. But I want to explain to you the two views. So the normative principle of worship ultimately boils down to the idea that, yes, we must do what God has commanded us to do in his word, right? But we are free to add any element of worship that we want to the mix, just so long as it does not do anything that God has explicitly forbidden, right? So if God says yes, then, 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 then do it. If God says no, then don't do it. Everything else is fair game. That is the normative principle of worship. The regulative principle of worship, on the other hand, maintains that we are only to do that which God has commanded. So we cannot add new elements of worship. So we would agree with the others that, yes, we are to do what God has commanded. No, we are not to do what God has forbidden. But this gray area, we are not free to add that in because God has not explicitly given that. Historically, Reformed churches, even historically Baptist churches have held to the regulative principle of worship, that second one. We see that God has commanded certain elements of worship, and we are not at liberty to make new ones. Again, I can't answer all the questions about it, but the basic idea is that worship is about God, and God decides how he should be worshipped. And to add other ways to worship him without his permission is presumptuous, and we should not do it. But that just explodes into a ton of questions, doesn't it? Don't, I mean, can't you think of so many, like, does, that, does this mean that every minute detail of worship under the new covenant is explicitly addressed in the New Testament? That, that, that. We're at Malachi, so I can, I can just do this. That all of New Covenant worship, every single bit of it, is found here. No, it doesn't. The Bible never addresses the color of the carpet. Whether we use chairs or pews. Whether we partake of the Lord's Supper in the beginning, the middle, or the end of service. There are a lot of things that the Bible never addresses about our worship. But it doesn't have to. What it gives us are elements of worship. These are the basic building blocks of corporate worship in the church, specifically corporate worship. Everything else here, like the chairs or pews or whatever, that we can call instruments of worship. So these are the things that enable us to observe the elements of worship. So I'm going to take a look at the elements of worship and look at some of the instruments that help us observe it. I'm not quite sure who said this. I, I think I might have heard it attributed to Tim Keller, but if, if I misattributed it, then I apologize. Um, he had a pretty interesting way of describing these elements of worship. So we read the Bible, we preach the Bible, we pray the Bible, we sing the Bible, and we see the Bible. So let's look at these elements. First, we read the Bible in our worship. There is a public reading of Scripture in our worship. And for our church, we have recently placed more emphasis on reading the Bible publicly in worship. We've been going through Psalm 119, and we'll continue going when Psalm 119 is done. But the weekly public reading of Scripture has been in our church at least I would imagine, since its very beginning, in some fashion, right? But what translation of the Bible do we use? Do we use screens or not? Do, do we all read it out loud together, or do we have one person lead and the others listen? These questions are not answered for us in Scripture. We don't have these answers. Each church is free to answer them their own way, 
but there should be public reading of Scripture. Because Paul's command to Timothy is still blessing churches today to devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture that we see in 1 Timothy 4.13. Secondly, the Bible is to be preached. There is to be a teaching proclamation of Scripture in the church. We go back to that 1 Timothy 4 passage. Paul doesn't stop at the public reading of Scripture. He says, until I come devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. A church that refuses to proclaim the truths of Scripture is a church that has failed to shepherd its sheep. A a church that refuses to proclaim the truths of Scripture is a church that has failed to shepherd its sheep. But how long are we to preach? Can only pastors preach? Or can unordained men under the supervision of a pastor preach as well? Again, churches have freedom here to to decide for themselves. It is not demanded of us in Scripture, these answers. But we are to preach the word in our corporate worship. Third, we are to pray the Bible. This is, we just said to pray the Bible, but, but the idea is that the content of our prayers should be very biblically informed. After all, this is God's house, is it not? And God's house shall be called a house of prayer. We are to pray. The content is to be biblically informed, but the form the specific words that we are to pray, how long we pray. We, we don't believe that that is given for us in Scripture. Some disagree. Some, some seem to think that you can only give the Lord's Prayer and that all of your prayers have to be our Father who art in heaven and go on, you know, usually, usually in King James English or in Latin, but, but we don't believe that. Next. We sing the Bible. Ephesians 5.19 makes it clear that we are to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The Bible doesn't give us an exhaustive list of songs to sing. Again, there are those who believe that it does. There are, to be honest, those who believe that we should only be singing the biblical psalms in corporate worship, or at least songs from the text of the Bible. And I would disagree with them, but, but, hold on, even if I did take their position, right, the Bible doesn't give us sheet music. We still have to decide that for ourselves, even if you want to take this exclusive psalmody position. We still have to decide how it's going to sound. We still have to decide, are we going to skip verse 3? We skip verse 3 in every other song, so we might as well skip verse 3 in these psalms, right? But that is up to us. We can decide what music is sung so long as it is scripturally informed, scripturally saturated. And so for some churches, that's going to mean that their Worship is going to be hymns. Virtually all, if not exclusively, hymns. For others, it will be very much contemporary music. For others, it'll be a blend. For others, it will be the Psalms only experience that I had just mentioned. And those are fine. The point is that we are singing. When the church stops singing, the church is in error. And last, we are to see the Bible. We are to see the Bible. I like this one because this is a reference to the ordinances of Scripture. That is what we see. We see baptism and the Lord's Supper. The Bible authorizes the church to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit commands us to baptize in water. 
If at all possible, the ideal condition is that we are to baptize by immersion. But whether that water that we baptize in is a baptistry in our own church building like we have back here, or if it's going to be at a lake or a river outside of the church, because if you can find a lake or a river inside of your church, you probably have structural issues. Um, That is left to us. Am am I wrong? Uh, As for the Lord's Supper, we are commanded to partake of it. That was one of the key problems in the Protestant Reformation, is that the, the average Christian under the Roman Catholic Church only partook of the bread. It was the priest who stood up and partook of the wine on behalf of his people. And that is not biblical. We are to partake. We as believers, until Christ comes again, we are commanded to partake of it. But is the bread supposed to be leavened or unleavened? That might sound trite, but it was a major cause of the great schism between the eastern and western halves of the church in the 11th century. And that's not the only question. That's not the question that we're going to hear the most of. Is it okay to use grape juice for communion? Or do we have to use wine? The scripture doesn't tell us. It's the fruit of the vine. That's the word used. Nor does it tell us explicitly how frequently it is to be observed. The fact is, godly men and godly women, godly congregations for hundreds of years have observed the Lord's Supper weekly, monthly, and quarterly. The scripture does not explicitly teach it. Ultimately, the frequency is up to us. What we do not have authority over is the amount of ordinances. Again, this is one of the errors of Rome. They do not have two ordinances, or sacraments as they call them, but but seven, right? They have baptism, they have confirmation, they have the Eucharist, they have confession, they have ordination, they have marriage, they have uh, the, the last rites or extreme unction, If you've grown up in a Catholic church, those words should sound quite familiar to you. But Christ never institutes these. Many of these things are great things. They are good things. He who finds a wife has found a good thing, right? Marriage is great. Confession is good. It is a good thing to confess. But it is not an ordinance of Christ that was established to be done in the local church. The only ordinances that are ordained by Christ are baptism and the Lord's Supper. We come to a close. What is corporate worship under the new covenant? If we looked at Malachi 1, 11 through 2, 9, how easy would it be to let our eyes glaze over the words that we don't use? The the concepts that we don't have anything to do with. We don't have priests. We don't have sacrifices. How easy can we write off the book of Malachi as outdated and unnecessary because the words are different than what we're using now, because the covenant that they were under is not the same covenant as what we are under. But that is just not true. What is corporate worship under the new covenant? It is gathering on the Lord's day when the Lord's people Um, gather and they read the word, hear the word preached, pray biblically informed prayers, sing biblically saturated songs, and where appropriate, administering the ordinances of Christ. We are never far from Malachi. We may not travel to Jerusalem anymore. We don't offer livestock to atone for sin, that has been dealt with. Amen? Christ has died on our behalf. We no longer need a sacrifice for sin because Christ is our sacrifice. He is our Passover lamb. 
But we don't offer livestock to atone for sin. We don't deal with Levitical priests anymore. But if we are not careful, we will sit in the pew while the word is being preached and be completely apathetic. We will stand. We will move our lips in accordance with the songs that we've always sung, that we know, that we see the the words on the screen. But our minds are elsewhere. We may stand up to read the word to the congregation, but never be bothered to have read it beforehand, and so we're unprepared. We may take the bread and the cup, yet our thoughts are on the afternoon when we can get some real food. We worship differently than Malachi did, but Malachi's words to the priest say a lot about how much God values the worship of him. That hasn't changed. And I'm, this is, I'm going off script a little bit. We have a hard enough time doing the things he's commanded. The regulative versus normative principles of worship, in my opinion, shouldn't even be a discussion because we're having a hard enough time doing what God has command, commanded. We don't have time to deal with extra things that we make up. We have a hard enough time worshiping God as he has commanded. Let me get back. Step off my soapbox for a minute. Um, God is jealous for our hearts. He values our worship. So church, let us prepare for worship. Let's take worship seriously. Worship matters. Our God has commanded it, and trust me, trust me, He is worth it. He deserves all of our worship and all of our praise. Let's pray. Lord God.